Hello and welcome to our webinar entitled Automated Object-Based Image Feature Extraction. We'd like to give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering today. We're going to be discussing a case study with the City of Toronto looking at urban environments. Some of the concepts and best practices for object-based image analysis are going to be discussed, including data pre-processing, image segmentation, classification, refining results, assessing accuracy, scaling up object-based image analysis to do larger production. We will be having a live demonstration today, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And of course, we'll have a wrap up and a Q&A at the end of the session. Presenters today include myself, Kevin Jones on the left, I'm the Director of Marketing at PCI Geomatics, and joining me is Jason Flatt, who is our Technical Solution Specialist. Jason's going to be giving the demonstration today. Just a few logistical notes. So the lines are going to be muted during the presentation. You uh, can ask questions if you wish, and uh, raise your hand if you have any problems at all during the session. We are recording the session, and we will send you a link. So uh, if you need to review anything or you want to share it with a colleague, you can definitely do that. But uh, if you want to stick around and watch live, and by all means. So we like to engage our audience as much as possible during these webinars. And the first question we have for you today is, how do you currently use imagery? So I'll launch that right now and uh, wait for uh, people to give their answers. We're interested to know this because uh, potentially the software that we are presenting today could provide a solution for you. Um, possibly there's some things that are limiting your use of image analysis software. It could be a lack of resources. It could be a lack of uh, knowledge. Um, some people do uh, limited image processing. Perhaps they only order the data directly that, that's been processed from a, from a vendor. Uh, possibly some people are doing heads-up digitizing and they're pulling features manually from imagery. Um, some people might be doing pixel-based image classification, which is a more traditional approach for medium to low-resolution imagery. But when we're dealing with high-resolution imagery, object-based image analysis is a preferable method. So I'm going to close that poll down in three seconds, give a little bit more time for you to submit your answers. Three, two, one. One, thanks very much for sharing your uh, answers on that. Very interesting results. And uh, we'll keep going here with the webinar. So just a quick word on PCI Geomatics as a company and the software solutions that we offer. This uh, represents very nicely the complete offering that we have. We like to refer to our software as a platform. It's a Geomatica platform. And it's really made up of individual software components that can be put together in, in different uh, types of uh, interfaces. So depending on whether you're working with a small amount of data or a larger amount of data, we do have a solution for every type of project. Geomatica is a GUI, so it's got a graphical user interface, and it really allows you to view imagery and perform detailed analysis. And you can perform some automation within Geomatica as well because we have a Python API available. When we get to higher end production, we do have a high volume production system known as GXL. And GXL basically leverages all the technology that's been developed in Geomatica, but it allows you to parallelize the processing on multiple compute nodes and to scale along with your projects as you're doing more and more data. So this is a very important concept. Um, we can work with a few images within Geomatica, uh, may maybe up to hundreds of images, and then as you move towards the thousands or tens of thousands of images, then you're probably more likely to be using one of our GXL production systems. So we'd like to present to you the case study that we've put together with the City of Toronto, and uh, this is a case study on feature extraction in urban environments. The City of Toronto, for those of you who may not be familiar, does have a very advanced geospatial capability. They have a, one of the, the best teams uh, developing technology, using the latest and greatest in, in terms of technology. And 
in terms of their use of geospatial technology, they're always looking to improve information extraction, accuracy, automation speed, with a mind to reduce costs for scaling up. And so over 2016 and 2017, the city chose to conduct some inter internal research on the use of object-based image analysis to help map impervious surfaces within the city. Some of the key findings based on that research are that object-based image analysis can speed up the process significantly on a per parcel basis. So this is something that was the subject of a uh, 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 research project and essentially the current process or the, the, the before uh, the standard process that was in place was to do manual heads up digitizing, which was taking on average 10 minutes per parcel. And then the automated process was sped up by a factor of 80 up to only, uh, as you can see, there are fractions of, of, of a minute. So, um, you know, literally much faster. And then, of course, with the speed, we need to retain accuracy. So the accuracy was measured independently, and uh, the accuracy was found to be uh, within 88%, roughly, the automated versus the manual method. This is just an example of some of the results. So here we see the manually extracted impervious surfaces on a per parcel basis. You can see the pink areas represent the buildings, the driveways, uh, sidewalks, anything that's non-vegetated. Uh, and the green areas are the vegetation areas. So you can see that the the uh, the outlines there are very accurate, um, but this process is time consuming. Uh, here we see an example of the automated uh, process and the results that it can produce. So we can see that although the polygons are maybe not as clean, the uh, percentage of area that's been mapped as impervious as compared to the uh, manual method is within 88% accuracy levels. So um, maybe not as aesthetically pleasing, but uh, definitely much faster and found to be very accurate as compared to the manual methods. Just a quick overview on the methodology. The object analyst tool can be used to classify and typically, we go through a, a number of steps. <clears throat> the input data preparations include extracting a digital surface model. So this is using stereo data. Within Geomatica, because there's an environment for processing many different types of data, in this case, UltraCam high-resolution stereo overlapping imagery, we're able to extract a digital surface model from the data, which is very useful for classification, as you'll see in the demonstration. The uh, other information that can be derived is a vegetation index. So here we see an NDVI layer. The UltraCam data that was used in this case does have infrared, which allows us to calculate the vegetation index, which again can be used, very useful for classification and for class uh, discrimination and deconflicting certain misclassified uh, objects. Atmospheric correction is important. This is more in terms of satellite imagery, typically, uh, where we need to remove the effects of the atmosphere. But these are all things that can be done in Geomatica before the actual object analyst uh, process can be run. The process for uh, classifying a, an entire image are as follows. So we segment the image, we extract statistics, we develop training sites, we do supervised classification, and then we go through a process of refining results and then finally, we merge the segmentation polygons that have been classified into individual classes. And then accuracy assessment can be performed on the data after that. Another method is using rule-based. So rather than classifying every single polygon that gets segmented in the image, we can actually target specific features of interest and only classify those features. So we are performing image classification. The only difference here is we're using rules and we're classifying one class at a time. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's more, a little bit more human intervention, although it can be automated, but uh, we basically can determine what thresholds to use and how to classify certain features in the uh, data set. So in this case, what we would do, very similar, all the data pre-preparation, and then the segmentation, uh, statistical uh, calculations, 
and then creating these rules. So maybe we're looking for features that are above a certain height above the ground that have an NDVI value of a certain uh, amount. Those could be our trees, for example, or vice versa. If the NDVI is low and the elevation is low, then maybe that's more likely to be an impervious surface. So things like that, we can define these rules and then we can either apply them interactively or potentially we could automate the process as well. So just a few notes on data preparation. So raw slash stereo imagery can be used to derive many useful layers. We, we will be showing you some of that in the demonstration. The digital elevation model, so a digital surface model represents everything above the surface as well as the ground. And then what we could do is we can filter those features off and produce a terrain model. And then if we take a, a difference of those two uh, elevation data sets, we, we can derive what's known as a height model. The ortho imagery and the mosaics, of course, are, are very critical to do the segmentation and to have all of the channel information. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we can perform band ratios, uh, vegetation indices, and calculate uh, texture measures. We'll be showing examples of this in the, in the next few slides. Here's an example of stereo data. So the data in this case has been aligned in epipolar space. So what I'll do is I'll toggle between this image and the next image. And if you keep your eye on this, uh, this, this large vehicle that's pulling out here, you'll notice that it's moving. So the, as, as the plane is flying across this particular location, the uh, features are moving, the, the, the vehicles are moving because there, there's time separation as the plane is traveling. And what's also changing is the viewing perspective on the buildings, which creates parallax, which can then be used to run an image correlation algorithm to extract the elevation values. So if we combine those two images, if you do have a pair of old style 3D anaglyph glasses sitting around, you can put them on right now and you could see these features in 3D. Uh, this is a 3D anaglyph representation. This is just for viewing. What PCI does through our software is we can run a correlation algorithm, as I mentioned, and extract the elevation values from all of these different features. So here's an example of a RGB image with some elevated uh, features. And if I switch to the resulting uh, digital surface model, you can see that we can measure the heights of all these different objects. So in this case, we've created the digital surface model, we've filtered the terrain off of the digital surface model, and then we generated this height model. So we can measure these cylinders relative to the ground. As you can see, the ground is at zero meters, and then we have different, different heights of different uh, cylinders or oil, oil containers. And uh, we also have some of the buildings over here. We know the exact height of those. Now, the other thing we can do is we can explore the spectral information that's contained in the data to derive spectral indices or vegetation indices. This is just a quick example of uh, only RGB. So in this case, we were only able to derive a greenness index. So it's, it doesn't have the infrared. So if we switch to the vegetation versus non-vegetation, using thresholding, we can basically decide what's most likely green, what's most likely non-green. So when we're performing the segmentation further down, we can attribute the polygons based on the mean values from these different layers to help us with our analysis. Another interesting thing that we can do, again, all within the Geomatica environment is calculate texture. So some different features will have a different uh, texture values. So you can see, for example, the uh, here we have the the mean and the standard deviation of different uh, types of features so we have a, a building we have some grass and uh, concrete and, and pavement and, and you can see that the the mean values differ so the grass the mean texture value for grass is definitely different from building and pavement and also concrete so there's some separation there and then also the standard deviation so how homogeneous is is the different uh, type of feature. So you can see number one here, the concrete, which is very white, very washed out, um, has a very, very low standard deviation. So that that's going to be helpful. Those are those are just pieces of information that we can use to help with our classification. 
So this is just the, the texture layer. So the actual uh, information that's contained when we derive this layer using Geomatica. Now the data can all be merged into a single data set. That's really one of the key advantages of using uh, object analyst within Geomatica. As you can see here, we can basically produce, go from the raw data, produce the DSM, the DTM, then we can generate the height model, calculate the vegetation indices, and then also get the texture. And so for every pixel in our image, we have all of these different channels of information. We have our red, green, blue, we have our DSM, we have our DTM, we have our height model, the green, red vegetation index. Here we have a band ratio, red over blue, and then we also have the uh, <clears throat> homogeneity layer. So all of this information inside a single PIX file, which is the format that's used by Geomatica, can then be used by object analysts for performing object-based image analysis. So just a few words about segmentation, which would be the first step. So the there are three key things that you can manipulate in terms of the segmentation. So the first thing is the scale. And the scale basically refers to how big of an object you wish to create when you do the segmentation. The segmentation is essentially a region growing algorithm. So it starts looking at a pixel, it looks at its neighbor, it determines whether its neighbor is similar or not, and then it keeps growing pixel by pixel and it creates objects. So the scale parameter is a value between five and 500. It determines the size of objects and it is affected by the resolution of the imagery. So if we have higher resolution imagery and a lower value, we'll get many, many, many small polygons. But if we have uh, a lower resolution image and a, and a low value, we'll actually get bigger polygons. We'll see that in the next slide. Here we see that we've left the, um, the only parameter that we're changing here is the scale. So we go from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, and you can see the effect that it has on the segmentation results. Just a quick note to uh, demonstrate that, of course, if you're working with higher resolution imagery, you will get more detailed objects. So in this case, we used a scale parameter of 50 on a Sentinel-2 image of the exact same location. This is, uh, this is the same location. You can see these uh, white buildings are much more uh, coarse in, in this data set. And we only have maybe five or six polygons, whereas here we literally have probably over 100 polygons. So just, just to clearly uh, demonstrate that the resolution of the data will of course affect the number of polygons that are generated through the segmentation. The, the, uh, the next thing that we can modify is the shape parameter. So the closer we get to point one, the more the segmentation will be affected by the spectral content in the image. And the closer we get to point nine, the more it will focus on the shape. And we really see that in this case, we've, we've, we've done the same segmentation at the same scale. And the only thing we change is, is the shape parameter. And you can see on the left, there's a strip of darker pavement in the middle of the road that gets isolated as, as a separate polygon. Whereas on the right, when we focus more on the shape, so we're, maybe we're trying to get more roads versus buildings versus grass, and we're, we're focusing less on the spectral content, we're getting a more uh, straightforward polygon over the road. The last uh, segmentation parameter we can play with is known as compactness. And really what this tries to do is look for objects that are uh, linear, so closer to point one would be folk trying to get more of a linear uh, size or style uh, segment, or round would be closer to point nine. So you can see there are some subtle differences here between the two different uh, results on the screen. I did mention the different types of classification methods. Um, there are three generally the uh, unsupervised, supervised, and rule-based. So real quickly on, on the unsupervised, basically what we, what we need is the image layers, we need the statistics for the polygon, and then we can run an unsupervised algorithm to just explore our data. Typically this is used as an exploration type of operation to understand how separable the different features are within our image and how many classes we can get from the data potentially. Supervised method, using all of the same uh, image layers and statistics, the thing that we're adding here 
is we're training the algorithm. So we're telling the algorithm what types of uh, polygons, what types of land cover those polygons are using either field work that we know or visual interpretation to give the algorithm information about how to classify the different objects. The results are going to be, the number of classes are going to be based on how many training classes are provided. So if we do, you know, 10 training classes, 10 with, with several training sites, we'll get 10 classes in our result. And this is typically to do a full classification of every single object in the data set. The third method is rule-based. So here we have, again, our image layers, our statistics for all the polygons. And then the additional thing that we have is the rule sets. So we can explore the data. Jason will be showing you how to do that. We can explore the data, look at the different thresholds, understand what kind of uh, parameters to set to, uh, to isolate certain classes, and then we can apply those rules to do the classification. The results are going to be only the features that we're interested in, so specific features are going to be extracted, and this really gives you more control on classification. It's a very, um, uh, it can be a, a very uh, exact uh, method of classifying, so rather than sort of relying on training sites and uh, using the support vector classification algorithm, here we can be very, very precise about what we want to do. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Jason. Jason's going to be giving you two demonstrations. One is going to be a supervised classification to map impervious surfaces. And then he'll also do a rule-based um, uh, demonstration for uh, oil container extraction. So over to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Kevin. Hello, everyone. As Kevin has mentioned, we can utilize object. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. As Kevin has mentioned, we can utilize Object Analyst for feature extraction to create analysis-ready data. It's very useful for areas when we're working with heterogeneous landscapes. Before I begin, I would like to provide an overview of the data we're working with today that we're using for feature extraction. First, we're working with aerial imagery that has been provided by the City of Toronto. It was collected at six centimeter resolution using an UltraCam. It contains both RGB and NIR cap with and captured at stereo overlap. With the pro algorithms and programs available with Geomatica, we we're able to pre-process the data to create a number of indices and elevation models. We developed our NDVI and NDWI. Using our stereo overlap, we generated the normalized height model. And lastly, we generated a texture or a, con a texture model as in current literature that has been documented when working with high resolution area imagery, uh, there can be spectral confusion for classifications, which is observed in regions that contain high spectral heterogeneity or shade. So the best solution is to create this texture indice that will help the program discern between the land cover types. Now, if you have Geomatica or you're thinking of downloading it, which you can locate it on our website, you can find the Object Analyst Processing window located in our Analysis tab. This will bring up the Object Analyst Wizard, which provides a drop-down list of operations that can guide the user, and depending upon the workflow, you may use or skip certain steps, which we'll, get, we'll see later on. Now, for the interest of time, I have already pre-processed or processed the data and results, but I will go through the steps. Now, as we can see on our right, we have a processing canvas that will keep track of all the steps we perform, so I will only be adding steps to the canvas. Now, let's begin a first operation. As Kevin has mentioned, we will be performing a segmentation first, which will divide the scene into homogeneous regions. Not only will it be based upon the spectral properties, but also shape, texture, and size. We will load our source imagery into the program, choosing our layers, such as the red, green, blue, and all the indices we derived. We have the option of changing and setting the parameters for scale, shape, and compactness. And for this system, for the scale, I will be setting it at 150 shape to 0.7, 
and leaving the compactness as default. As mentioned, the scale based upon the type of features we're trying to extract, smaller scale, higher detail, smaller features, the shape impacts the decision of how the segmentation is going to grow. Are we either going to base it upon spectral content of the pixels, so spectral similarity, or the shape of the surrounding pixels, so do the pixels join together to make some shape? Now, depending upon what the user desires to extract, when working with an example of a forest, a mixed area, the low shape will produce smaller segmentation as the program can identify the spectral differences between the uh, line cover. Now, the segmentation after we run this process, we see that the image has been segmented based upon all the parameters, or all the indices and layers that we provided. Now, before I continue, I would like to make mention that for the purpose of this presentation, I set the scale at a quite a high value. However, for the purpose of identifying uh, permeable and impermeable surfaces, it is recommended that you set the scale between 25 and 35. Now, if we take a look at the segmented region, we can see that the pavement has been segmented, the shadow, the grass, the pavement, the cars, the trees, all the different plate objects have been segmented. The next step we can take is to perform a feature extraction. Now, not to be confused with the goal of this process, but a feature extraction actually collects statistics of the pixels underlying the segments based upon the different channels we select. Now, if we choose our source channels, we have our image. We can choose the different layers we want to make use of to collect statistics. I'll choose all of them for this purpose. Choose our vector layer for the segment. And here I can choose what type of statistics I want to calculate. I can choose mean, standard deviation, min, max, but I also have the option to collect geometric attributes, which can help reduce misclassification through querying and reclassifying of polygons. And I'll get to show you guys that later on. Now, after we run the process, the, at the segmentation attribute table is populated with the information. So if we scroll over, we can see that the mean and DVI, contrast, height, and standard deviation for all the segments has been calculated. Now, before we continue to perform our classification, I would like to, again, quickly go over the different types of classification methods we offer. Now, of course, as Kevin mentioned, we have unsupervised, supervised, and rule-based classification. And for this process, we're going to be making use of the supervised classification. When you're running the supervised classification, we collect training sites to train the algorithm to perform the classification. Now, before I continue through the classification, we're going to go to our training site editor operation. And this is the first step for supervised classification. And here is where we can collect training sites and for accuracy assessment and algorithm training. If we open up the training site editor, we have Three, we have a number of places where we can add classes. We can add as many classes as we want, change their names for the training, give them a color, and training count and accuracy count. Now, for this process, I'm going to be working with three different training sites, or three different training types, which is impermeable ground features, buildings, and vegetation. Now, if you see on the right, we have training count and accuracy count. These two columns, are used so the training count is used for the classification algorithm while the accuracy count is used to refine the training site collection and reduce class confusion and improve overall accuracy now i want to make sure that you want to make sure to collect a variety of segments for each class and i have already collected the training sites but we can go and collect a few additional ones if we scroll down here so it's recommended you collect a wide variety so different surface types in the, same, in the same class, shaded, unshaded. Now, the way to collect training sites is you choose your class that you want to use. So we're going to choose impermeable ground. We're going to choose the sample type if we want it in the training count or the accuracy count. We can then select the segments we want to collect. So we'll select these impermeable ground, these pavement options, and then we can assign them to the count. You see, now once we've assigned them, they've changed their color 
and depending upon what uh, column they've been categorized into, either they'll be full or they won't be full of the color. Now, once we are satisfied with the training sites that we have collected, we can then close the training site editor and open our classification operation. Here we're going to choose our vector layer, so the segments. We will choose the segment and here we can choose which statistics that we've generated we'll be using for classification. Excuse me, sorry. For this purpose, we're going to select all the statistics we generated, but we're going to exclude area, perimeter, and pixel value. <laughs> we'll select OK. Choose the type as supervised. Set the training field as training, and then give it a name. We'll call it class. We can then run the process. Nope. Oh, we can run the process. And the final results are seen here. All the segments have been classified based upon our training sites that we collected. They've been either classified as the permeable or the vegetation, the impermeable, and the building. But I would like to take your attention to one specific area of interest in the bottom right corner. We can see here that some segments have been misclassified. Well, we can't have that, can we? No. So either we have a few, we have a few options we can use to, re, to correct these misclassified segments. Either we can return to our training site editor and refine the training sites that we've collected, or we can make use of our rule-based classification operation and develop conditions to select and change these misclassified segments. So let's make use of our rule-based classification. We'll go to our rule-based operation, and here we have our segment to layer pre-populated. We can choose the class field that we already created, so classification. Choose the filter as what has been misclassified as. So they've been misclassified as building. And what do we want to change them to? So what is the new class they're going to be changed into, which is vegetation. And now we can develop, generate our condition. And we have two options on how we can do this. We can either pick the range, which opens up our WYSIWYG viewer that displays the segments that will be changed by the new rule and actually highlights them. So for class field, classification, building, and we're going to make use of our mean NTVI statistic that we calculated previously. We can move the maximum value all the way to the end and all these segments have been classified or have been highlighted, and we can bring the minimum slider up just until those segments have been highlighted. We can then click OK, but we can also build our condition, which opens up our condition builder, and we can even change it. I personally like to round things up, so I'm going to change it to 0 0.41. <laughs> click OK. We can then run this process which reclassifies those misclassified segments into the vegetation uh, class we desire. Once we are happy with the results, we can then dissolve the polygons to create larger features or objects. And here <laughs> we can use the reform shapes. We can set the class as classification and set the output and the final results Let me just move this away. And here is the final results. All those segments have been reclassified. And if we zoom in to the area of interest, we can see that those misclassified segments have been changed and reformed into the overall vegetation region. Now, if we want to do further analysis to our generated uh, objects, we can then perform an additional feature extraction so we can use this for further analysis. The idea is if we open up our segment and look at our attribute table, we can, gen we can see that the statistics have been generated. So if we want the height or the mean NIR or NDVI of a certain building, we now have that available. Now, the next option is 
the rule-based classification feature extraction. So we can close this project file and open our next one, as Kevin has mentioned. And here we're going to be showing just the rule-based feature extraction workflow. In this classification method, it's, we are only going to extract a specific type of features. And for this one, we're going to extract the oil containers, such as these objects over here. Now, the workflow is similar as we perform our segmentation, our feature extraction, but then we jump right to the classification based upon roles. So following the same steps, we open up our object analyst. We can then perform our segmentation on our image, choose all the images required. However, for this object, we're only going to be segmenting based upon the height, the height, the NDVI, and the contrast. This just goes to show that depending on what you're trying to extract, you may or you may not use all the data available. Once we run our segmentation, we can then perform our feature extraction. And here is where we can make use of our geometrical attribute calculation as we're trying to collect or extract circular oil containers. So we should especially choose our geometrical compactness, circularity, elongation, and rectangularity options, as well as mean and standard deviation. Once we run the process, we can open up the attribute table and see that the statistics have been generated as well as, well as the geometrical attributes. Once we have run our feature extraction, we can then go to our rule-based classification, thus skipping the training site, editor, and the classification. Here, we create a new class field. So we're going to call this class create. We can then set a new class. So what are the new features we want to create, which will be oil. We can then specify the condition, which we can open up again our WYSIWYG viewer, and choose our class, choose the circularity option, or actually I'll get none selected. We'll choose our circularity option, and I can move our maximum minimum value until all those circular containers are selected. Now let's move this the minimum value, so only the circular containers are selected. Here we go. Point one. I can then again go back and build my condition, so I can increase this to 0 0.52. Select OK, and add and run. The segments have then been classified, but they're still not being displayed. So we can go to our representation editor, advanced, we can go to more, we can choose attribute based upon the class, update the styles, and apply. And now we have the segments or the oil containers that we want highlighted differently. We can then perform a reform shapes to extract the segmented containers, choosing a class, setting an output as oil, giving it the layer of oil, and then add and run. And here we have, although there's a misclassification up there, which we can fix later on, but we have the oil containers selected and separated, and we can perform an additional feature extraction for further analysis. In conclusion, there are two methods that we can employ to perform feature extractions on aerial imagery. Thank you, Jason, for that great demo. Hopefully that gives everyone a chance uh, to get a sense of how easy it is to use Object Analyst. As uh, mentioned, it is a tool that is available within Geomatica, and uh, you can see there that it's a very uh, simple tool to use and very powerful as well. So we'd like to uh, 
uh, engage you once again with another poll. So the uh, current question that we're going to be uh, asking is related to your biggest imagery related challenge. Um, so uh, we're just curious to know if you are working with imagery or, or not, what, what are the, some of the reasons maybe, or what are the challenges that you're facing? So perhaps processing imagery is, is a complex task that uh, you're not equipped to, uh, to handle and uh, maybe some uh, easy to use software would help with that. Uh, perhaps you don't have any trained staff to perform the image analysis. Uh, maybe you're wondering if it's uh, going to be worth your investment in terms of purchasing software or training resources to do the image analysis to get a positive return on investment. Um, and, and finally, the last option there is whether uh, you keep original imagery or not. A lot of the demonstration um, components that we show rely on the use of what we call raw data or close to raw data, so stereo data, not orthorectified. Um, really, that's the most uh, uh, powerful type of data that you can use because you can transform it yourself using our software and derive your own information. So. Um, I'll leave that open for three more seconds. So three, two, one. Thank you very much for participating in that poll. Interesting results to uh, to see, and uh, we'll keep going here just to sum up on the uh, on the webinar. So the review, uh, we hope that you th agree with us that uh, object analyst is an easy to learn and easy to use object based uh, image segmentation and analysis tool. Uh, we certainly designed the interface and the tool to make it more sort of wizard based and, and easy to use so it should be fairly easy to get going and processing data and, and generating results the uh, dynamic rule-based classification we think really gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of exploring your data understanding what's in your data and uh, really making use of uh, of the of the full uh, data sets that you have available the segmentation, uh, as you saw, is quite good. It provides uh, uh, detailed uh, features, or uh, it, 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 it has all of the, the normal segmentation parameters, and it is a proprietary segmentation algorithm that we continually are developing and improving, both in terms of its accuracy and also in terms of its speed. So um, we're constantly trying to make that process go faster and faster. The uh, classification that uh, Jason used in the demonstration there is the uh, classification that is uh, the only classification classifier that is available, which is called Support Vector Machine. So Support Vector Machine is a form of machine learning, and uh, we have done a lot of scientific research and looked at all the papers, and our uh, lead scientists have chosen SVM as the classifier because we believe it to be the most accurate as compared to others such as random forest and, and other tools uh, having said that if you do insist on using random forest or other classifiers there are ways to walk your data over uh, in tabular form to r or other statistical packages and perform the classification the uh, object reshaping we showed you mainly just the automatic dissolve uh, but there are manual tools for reshaping the geometry to really sort of create the uh, high accuracy or highly detailed results if you wish to have those uh, little blemishes fixed. Uh, perhaps uh, there's a tree shadow uh, falling over a water body and uh, that's being classified as tree and you just want to clean that up. Uh, it's very easy to do that in our software. The uh, current software is always being improved. We are working on uh, Geomatica 2018, which is soon to be released. There will be a specific tool to handle object-based image analysis for radar data, for synthetic aperture radar data. We also will have region of interest-based segmentation. Um, so you can specify a region of interest and uh, only segment that part of the image. Perhaps if you have a very big data set and you just want to experiment over a small area, you can definitely do that. That's in the next version. And uh, we are working in the background on automation. So uh, maybe not in the next release, but very soon we will be providing methods by which you can automate large uh, data processing. And we do have 
uh, the ability to provide a solution for that at the moment. So if you are interested in doing large uh, automation, object-based automation, uh, do get in touch so we can uh, have a conversation about that. Uh, these are just some highlights of the SAR-based image analysis that's, going, that's coming. So you can see for a fully polarimetric radar image on the left, we basically take care of all the image pre-processing inside object analyst. So we perform the um, calibration of the data, we uh, import all of the channels, we can pre-calculate things like um, uh, polarimetric decompositions like beta angle, anisotropy, entropy, alpha angle. These are all uh, de image decompositions for that can provide information for the classification. So that'll be done uh, as part of the object analyst process. There won't, you won't need to go external. And then the other step, of course, is the filtering, which is very important for radar data to reduce the noise. So we, we do have different algorithms available for whether you're working with quad pole or dual pole data. These are just some results showing the uh, segmentation of a fully polarimetric radar image over Fort McMurray in Alberta. You can see that the data has been uh, segmented at different scale factor with the same uh, shape and compactness values. The data has also been filtered using the same values and the tail trim basically is just a way to remove the noise in the, in the data. Region of interest is something that's coming. So here's another example. So we have uh, uh, some polygons here on the left that are showing where we want to perform the segmentation. So where the polygon overlaps the image is where the segmentation will be performed. So you can see that the areas that are not covered by a polygon are not being segmented. So this is just a nice way to work uh, for a specific part of the image if you wish to do that. In terms of scaling up for massive processing, so when we worked on this case study with the City of Toronto, um, they, they really liked the results, uh, but one of the key challenges that they faced is the ability to scale this up in, in a massive way. So the small piece of data that uh, Jason was working on represents about one tile, um, and, and they have about 4,000 tiles. Uh, so the area is about 643 square kilometers, and you can imagine that uh, training the algorithm every single time and uh, working inside uh, focus for such a large data set could become problematic if you're working on, the, on a large data set. So the city of Toronto uh, really has big, big, big data over, over the entire uh, land area because of the resolution, as you saw, it was quite high. Um, so this becomes uh, problematic. So the way that we're proposing to get around this problem and the technology that we're developing right now is we're basically allowing, going, we're going to be allowing you to train a model and establish a template using the GUI, so the same tools that Jason was demonstrating, and then that would basically create a template that could be used for all of the images in the data set. So the process would be the same. The first step would be to create a tile, take one of the tiles from the big data, uh, create all the channels, then do go through the whole process, and you can see here in the middle, when we run the supervised classification, we, we will be creating a text file, which is called trained SVM model .text. Um, The user can decide what they call it. But what this is doing is it's capturing the uh, classification information that the model used based on the training data that can then be used again on other tiles to replicate the classification results. So when we go to the bigger data set, what we can do is we can take our template, we can take our train model, and then we can implement that into an automated workflow. So these are some of the algorithms that are coming. We have a segmentation. So these are all up at the Python level, so they can be automated. Segmentation, attribute calculation, then we insert the model that we will calculate based on our template, and then we can run the classification and the dissolve operation across the entire data set. So these, these are all uh, important pieces of technology that are coming within, within the uh, desktop tools, uh, but they are available internally. So if you are interested in working on projects and you'd like to talk to us about that, uh, by all means, get in touch. Just wrapping up, I guess, uh, for next steps, you can head to getgeomatica.com to download a copy of the software. Uh, we encourage you to visit our support uh, website, which has a discussion forum and many tutorials and webinars just like this one. 
we have developer resources, training courses. We have many, many different uh, types of material available. You can search the uh, support area for object analyst. You can just type in, do a free text search within the search tool, and you'll land on some uh, specific object analyst tutorials if you want to follow along. Um, you can see some of the results there from, from there. And just before we go to the Q&A, we just want to do our last poll, which is, would you be interested in getting in touch? So this one should be pretty quick. Um, maybe you have some sample data and uh, you'd like to get in touch so we can help you evaluate whether the technology is the right fit for you, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, maybe you have some sample data and you have skilled personnel and you'd prefer to evaluate it on your own. Uh, or maybe this isn't a right fit for you today and uh, you don't need this type of uh, solution today and you're more sort of educating yourself as to what's available in the market. So this will just help us to understand sort of where you're coming from and if you'd like to get help from us. I'm just going to close that down in three, two, one. Thank you for giving us uh, some information on that. And... Uh, at this point, we will go to Q&A. Um, we've received many questions. We thank you for all of them. Uh, we did have someone uh, uh, monitoring and uh, providing answers to your questions, so we really thank you for that. We encourage you to get in touch with us. Uh, you can head to our website, pcigmax.com. We're very active on social media and YouTube. We monitor all of those different outlets. Um, so if you do want to get in touch, you can send us an email or you can drop us a, a message on any one of those social media platforms. We would be happy to speak with you. So with that, I'd like to thank Jason. I'd like to thank you for being here today and uh, wish you all the best and good luck with uh, your evaluation of Object Analyst. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone.